Chapter 4 Aliens Truly, that which makes me believe there is no inhabitant on this sphere is that it seems to me that no sensible being would be willing to live here. Well then, said Micromegas, perhaps the beings that inhabit it do not possess good sense. One alien to another on approaching the earth in Voltaire's Micromegas, A Philosophical History, 1752. It's still dark out. You're lying in bed, fully awake. You discover you're utterly paralyzed. You sense someone in the room. You try to cry out. You cannot. Several small gray beings, less than four feet tall, are standing at the foot of the bed. Their heads are pear-shaped, bald, and large for their bodies. Their eyes are enormous, their faces expressionless and identical. They wear tunics and boots. You hope this is only a dream. But as nearly as you can tell, it's really happening. They lift you up, and, eerily, they and you slip through the wall of your bedroom. You float out into the air. You rise high toward a metallic saucer-shaped spacecraft. Once inside, you are escorted into a medical examining room. A larger but similar being, evidently some kind of physician, takes over. What follows is even more terrifying. Your body is probed with instruments and machines, especially your sexual parts. If you're a man, they may take sperm samples. If you're a woman, they may remove ova or fetuses, or implant semen. They may force you to have sex. Afterwards, you may be ushered into a different room where hybrid babies or fetuses, partly human and partly like these creatures, stare back at you. You may be given an admonition about human misbehavior, especially in despoiling the environment or in allowing the AIDS pandemic. Tableaus of future devastation are offered. Finally, these cheerless grey emissaries escort you out of the spacecraft and ooze you back through the walls into your bed. By the time you're able to move and talk, they're gone. You may not remember the incident right away. Instead, you might simply find some period of time unaccountably missing and puzzle over it. Because all this seems so weird, you're a little concerned about your sanity. Naturally, you're reluctant to talk about it. At the same time, the experience is so disturbing that it's hard to keep it bottled up. It all pours out when you hear of similar accounts, or when you're under hypnosis with a sympathetic therapist, or even when you see a picture of an alien in one of the many popular magazines, books, and TV specials on UFOs. Some people say they can recall such experiences from early childhood. Their own children, they think, are now being abducted by aliens. It runs in families. It's a eugenics program, they say, to improve the human breeding stock. Maybe aliens have always done this. Maybe, some say, that's where humans came from in the first place. As revealed by repeated polls over the years, most Americans believe that we're being visited by extraterrestrial beings in UFOs. In a 1992 Roper poll of nearly 6,000 American adults, especially commissioned by those who accept the alien abduction story at face value, 18% reported sometimes waking up paralyzed aware of one or more strange beings in the room. About 13% report odd episodes of missing time, and 10% claim to have flown through the air without mechanical assistance. From nothing more than these results, the poll sponsors conclude that 2% of all Americans have been abducted, many repeatedly, by beings from other worlds. The question of whether respondents had been abducted by aliens was never actually put to them. If we believed the conclusion drawn by those who bankrolled and interpreted the results of this poll, and if aliens are not partial to Americans, then the number for the whole planet would be more than a hundred million people. This means an abduction every few seconds over the past few decades. It's surprising more of the neighbors haven't noticed. What's going on here? When you talk with self-described abductees, most seem very sincere although caught in the grip of powerful emotions. Some psychiatrists who've examined them say they find no more evidence of psychopathology in them than in the rest of us. Why should anyone claim to have been abducted by alien creatures if it never happened? Could all these people be mistaken, or lying, or hallucinating the same or a similar story? Or is it arrogant and contemptuous even to question the good sense of so many? On the other hand, could there really be a massive alien invasion? Repugnant medical procedures performed on millions of innocent men, women, and children. Humans apparently used as breeding stock over many decades. 
And all this not generally known and dealt with by responsible media, physicians, scientists, and the government sworn to protect the lives and well-being of their citizens? Or, as many have suggested, is there a massive government conspiracy to keep the citizens from the truth? Why should beings so advanced in physics and engineering, crossing vast interstellar distances, walking like ghosts through walls, be so backward when it comes to biology? Why, if the aliens are trying to do their business in secret, wouldn't they perfectly expunge all memories of the abductions? Too hard for them to do? Why are the examining instruments macroscopic and so reminiscent of what can be found at the neighborhood medical clinic? Why go to all the trouble of repeated sexual encounters between aliens and humans? Why not steal a few egg and sperm cells? Read the full genetic code, and then manufacture as many copies as you like with whatever genetic variations happen to suit your fancy. Even we humans, who as yet cannot quickly cross interstellar space or slither through walls, are able to clone cells. How could humans be the result of an alien breeding program if we share 99.6% of our active genes with the chimpanzees? We're more closely related to chimps than rats are to mice. The preoccupation with reproduction in these accounts raises a warning flag, especially considering the uneasy balance between sexual impulse and societal repression that has always characterized the human condition, and the fact that we live in a time fraught with numerous ghastly accounts, both true and false, of childhood sexual abuse. Contrary to many media reports, the Roper pollsters and those who wrote the official report never asked whether their subjects had been abducted by aliens. They deduced it. Those who've ever awakened with strange presences around them, who've ever unaccountably seemed to fly through the air and so on, have therefore been abducted. The pollsters didn't even check to see if sensing presences, flying, etc., were part of the same or separate incidents. Their conclusion, that millions of Americans have been so abducted, is spurious, based on careless experimental design. Still, at least hundreds of people, perhaps thousands, claiming they have been abducted, have sought out sympathetic therapists or joined abductee support groups. Others may have similar complaints, but fearing ridicule or the stigma of mental illness have refrained from speaking up or getting help. Some abductees are also said to be reluctant to talk for fear of hostility and rejection by hardline skeptics, although many willingly appear on radio and TV talk shows. Their diffidence supposedly extends even to audiences that already believe in alien abductions. But maybe there's another reason. Might the subjects themselves be unsure, at least at first, at least before many retellings of their story, whether it was an external event they are remembering or a state of mind? One unerring mark of the love of truth, wrote John Locke in 1690, is not entertaining any proposition with greater assurance than the proofs it is built upon will warrant. On the matter of UFOs, how strong are the proofs? The phrase flying saucer was coined when I was entering high school. The newspapers were full of stories about ships from beyond in the skies of Earth. It seemed pretty believable to me. There were lots of other stars, at least some of which probably had planetary systems like ours. Many stars were as old or older than the Sun, so there was plenty of time for intelligent life to evolve. Caltech's Jet Propulsion Laboratory had just flown a two-stage rocket high above the Earth. Clearly we were on our way to the Moon and the planets. Why shouldn't other, older, wiser beings be able to travel from their star to ours? Why not? This was only a few years after the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Maybe the UFO occupants were worried about us and sought to help us. Or maybe they wanted to make sure that we and our nuclear weapons didn't come and bother them. Many people seem to see flying saucers, sober pillars of the community, police officers, commercial airline pilots, military personnel. And apart from some harumphs and giggles, I couldn't find any counter-arguments. How could all these eyewitnesses be mistaken? What's more, the saucers had been picked up on radar and pictures had been taken of them. You could see the photos in newspapers and glossy magazines. There were even reports about crashed flying saucers and little alien bodies with perfect teeth stiffly languishing in Air Force freezers in the southwest. The prevailing climate was summarized in Life magazine a few years later in these words. These objects cannot be explained by present science as natural phenomena, but solely as artificial devices created and operated by a high intelligence. Nothing known or projected on Earth could account for the performance of these devices. 
and yet not a single adult I knew was preoccupied with UFOs. I couldn't figure out why not. Instead, they were worried about communist China, nuclear weapons, McCarthyism, and the rent. I wondered if they had their priorities straight. In college, in the early 1950s, I began to learn a little about how science works, the secrets of its great success, how rigorous the standards of evidence must be if we are really to know something is true, how many false starts and dead ends have plagued human thinking, how our biases can color our interpretation of the evidence, and how often belief systems widely held and supported by the political, religious, and academic hierarchies turn out to be not just slightly in error, but grotesquely wrong. I came upon a book called Extraordinary Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds, written by Charles Mackay in 1841, and still in print. In it could be found the histories of boom and bust economic crazes, including the Mississippi and South Sea bubbles and the extravagant run on Dutch tulips, scams that bamboozled the wealthy and titled of many nations, a legion of alchemists, including the poignant tale of Mr. Kelly and Dr. D., and Dee's eight-year-old son Arthur, impressed by his desperate father into communicating with the spirit world by peering into a crystal, dolorous accounts of unfulfilled prophecy, divination and fortune-telling, the persecution of witches, haunted houses, popular admiration of great thieves, and much else. Entertainingly portrayed was the Count of Saint-Germain, who dined out on the cheerful pretension that he was centuries old, if not actually immortal. When, at dinner, incredulity was expressed at his recounting of his conversations with Richard the Lionhearted, he turned to his manservant for confirmation. You forget, sir, was the reply. I have been only five hundred years in your service. Ah, true, said Saint-Germain. It was a little before your time. A riveting chapter on the Crusades began, Every age has its peculiar folly. Some scheme, project, or fantasy into which it plunges, spurred on either by the love of gain, the necessity of excitement, or the mere force of imitation. Failing in these, it has some madness, to which it is goaded by political or religious causes, or both combined. The edition I first read was adorned by a quote from the financier and adviser of presidents, Bernard M. Baruch, attesting that reading Mackay had saved him millions. There had been a long history of spurious claims that magnetism could cure disease. Paracelsus, for example, used a magnet to suck diseases out of the human body and dispose of them into the earth. But the key figure was Franz Mesmer. I had vaguely understood the word mesmerize to mean something like hypnotize. But my first real knowledge of Mesmer came from Mackay. The Viennese physician had thought that the positions of the planets influenced human health and was caught up in the wonders of electricity and magnetism. He catered to the declining French nobility on the eve of the revolution. They crowded into a darkened room. Dressed in a gold-flowered silk robe and waving an ivory wand, Mesmer seated his marks around a vat of dilute sulfuric acid. The magnetizer and his young male assistants peered deeply into the eyes of their patients and rubbed their bodies. They grasped iron bars protruding into the solution or held each other's hands. In contagious frenzy, Aristocrats, especially young women, were cured left and right. Mesmer became a sensation. He called it animal magnetism. For the more conventional medical practitioner, though, this was bad for business. So French physicians pressured King Louis XVI to crack down. Mesmer, they said, was a menace to public health. A commission was appointed by the French Academy of Sciences that included the pioneering chemist Antoine Lavoisier and the American diplomat and expert on electricity Benjamin Franklin. They performed the obvious control experiment. When the magnetizing effects were performed without the patient's knowledge, no cures were affected. The cures, if any, the commission concluded, were all in the mind of the beholder. Mesmer and his followers were undeterred. One of them later urged the following attitude of mind for best results. Forget for a while all of your knowledge of physics. Remove from your mind all objections that may occur. Never reason for six weeks. Be very credulous, 